So what is this, part five now? Okay, today's the last day we're going to spend on PowerPoint and systems. The last time we left off, we were looking at this diagram. And we had filled in a few things. Let's see if I can get my device here to go. Whoops. So we had a battery. This is the negative side, and this is the positive side. Uh, Mr. Flores, what's this device right here? It's a switch. In this case, this switch, if I close the switch and I connect it right there, what does that do? I have a closed circuit. What's the circuit that is now closed? According to this diagram, if you turn this switch to the closed position, What's going, what are these items here are going to get turned on? Well, I know, but let's say as drawn. Is this switch open or closed? None of them? I don't see a switch over here. Is there a switch in this thing? Hey, LX. What this, divide, this, this symbol down here with the three lines that get smaller, what's that called? A ground. What's it connected to? That is correct. One side of it is connected to the battery. Uh, Rodrigo, the other side of the ground, where is it connected to? Where is this symbol here? Where is it connected to? To all the other grounds. Typically, uh, Jordan, what is the ground? What is what, When we say it's connected to ground, what's physically on the airplane that is the ground? Pardon me? The bottom of the what? The bottom of the engine? Yeah, it's connected to the bottom of the engine. What else is connected to it? Brian. Well, everything is quite a you know, it's not connected to my shoe. When you say everything, can you be more specific? All the metal of the airplane, yeah, that's correct. Just like in a car, the negative side of the battery is connected to the metal of the of the car. Everything that's grounded is connected to the metal of the battery. So you'll notice there's no switch from the negative side of the battery to the ground. So the, the metal of the airplane, most of the airplane, is always connected to the negative side of the battery, and there's no switch to disconnect it. We connect or disconnect the battery using the electrical master switch. So, Jaron, which way do electrons go? Do they go from the negative side of the battery to the positive side or from the positive side to the negative side? They go from negative to positive, so they're going to leave the negative side of the battery. Uh, Brandon, if you were to describe a fully charged battery, how would you describe a fully charged battery? I'll give you a hint. What's going on on the negative side of the battery if the battery is fully charged? It's all charged up. Well, it's true that electrons try to go to the positive side. That's correct. But if you had to describe the battery and you said it's fully charged, and then somebody said, well, what's, 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 what is there a lot of on the negative side of the battery? What's trying to go from the negative side to the positive side? Electrons. So would you like to have a few electrons on the negative side, or would you like to have a lot if the battery's charged and ready to go? It hasn't been discharged yet. Try again. A lot, yeah. If the battery is fully charged, you would want to have a lot of negative electrons on the negative side. And Luis, if the negative side of the battery has a lot of electrons, how would you describe the positive side of the battery? Few what? Few electrons. That's correct. And wherever there's not enough electrons, it's positively charged. So what Brandon said is correct. If the battery's charged, all these negative electrons on the negative side of the battery are somehow going to try to get to the positive side. So if we close this switch, the electrical master switch, this device right here, whatever it is, and this I don't I just made I just made up a box. I don't know what it is. The electrons will travel and try to go through that device, through this device through the bus bar, 
and to the positive side of the battery. So that electron isn't there anymore, and it fills up this hole. It fills up this lack of electrons, and now the battery is very, very slightly discharged. So as long as there's extra electrons on the negative side of the battery, we can turn on the battery switch, the master switch, and things will work. The problem is at some point the battery will run down and most of the electrons will go to the other side and the battery won't put out enough power to do anything. So generally what we do is we start the engine and we make the alternator spin. So we make this alternator spin. So Josh, on a 12 volt system, you could also call it a 14 volt system, what component in here if the, uh, is putting out 12.6 volts? Try again. It's not the alternator. The battery. The battery, if it's brand new and fully charged and it's 80 degrees Fahrenheit, it'll put out 12.6 volts. So today it's a little over 80, so it's pretty good. If, I went out to, if you went out to your car with a lead-acid battery, and 99.9% .9 of cars have lead-acid batteries, you go out to your car and you put a voltmeter on it and measure the voltage. That's the pressure. It's like water pressure. That's the pressure. Your voltmeter would read about 12.6. It might read 12.4. It might be 12.8, but it would be really close to 12.6. Now, if we start the engine and the alternator is spinning, the alternator will provide electrical power similar to what the battery will, but it provides it at a higher voltage. Do you remember what that voltage is? I'll give you a hint. It's not exactly 14. No, it's not 14.2. Did anybody write it down? I know it's tough. We're in here taking notes, and if you, you might not have written it down. How, what? Did you write it down, uh, Freddie? Does anybody know? What does the alternator put out if, in a 12-volt system when the alternator is running? Nobody wrote that down. How interesting. 13.5 to 14 volts. That's how much the alternator will generate when the alternator is being spun by the engine. Question? Okay. So, once we get the alternator up and running, it's putting out a slightly higher voltage than the battery. Of these two components, or the alternator, well, we'll start in the middle, Brian. Which one of these two components, if everything's working correctly and they're both running, which of these two components will power all of the components in the system? The ones that has the higher voltage. So in this case, Brian, which one has the higher voltage? The alternator. Of course, if the alternator is not spinning, it puts out zero, though, so it's pretty obvious that the battery has the higher voltage. So literally now, instead of, here, I'm going to change my color here. Green, okay. So instead of the electrons leaving the battery and powering this device over here, the electrons, and this is the negative side of the alternator and the positive side of the alternator, the electrons are now going to go through our devices, or go through this device, through the circuit breaker, through the bus bar. Whoops. Of course, it won't work unless I have turned on the alternator switch. In cars, when you turn the key to the on position, it turns on this battery switch. It also turns on the alternator switch. In little airplanes, it's typically two switches right next to each other. And you usually turn them both on at the same time. But every now and then, you might want to turn the alternator on or off separately. Okay, so if that alternator switch is on, then yay, the alternator is what's producing the power. So here's what really gets crazy. If the alternator has a higher voltage than the battery... Well, here, let me ask you this question. If that battery is at 12.6 volts and the alternator is not turned on yet and that battery is slowly discharging, we're going to wish at some point, maybe after we start the engine and the alternator spins, we would like to charge the battery back up. We have drained the battery pretty good when we started the engine. It probably took about 10% of the, horse, the power out of the battery. I'm just making that up. Maybe it's 5%. Depends on the engine. Correction depends on the battery and depends on how easy it was to start. If you had to go rah, 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 you might be taking a lot of power out of the battery. But that battery has discharged because you used the starter motor. We'd like to charge it back up 
So at some point when we shut the engine off and come back a day later, the battery has enough power to start the engine all over again. So we have to charge the battery. Now, here's what's interesting. Electrons always go from where there's not enough electrons to where there's, correction, from where there's too many electrons to where there's not enough. So this alternator is actually pushing the electrons in this direction. And there's not enough electrons on this side. Correction, there's too many electrons on that side and not enough electrons on the positive side. And, and electrons, they are attracted to where there's not enough electrons. So you're probably thinking, how do these negative electrons, how do they go all the way around and get over to the other side of the battery? Well, they don't. You can think of it like this. If we want to charge the battery, we'd like to suck the electrons out of the positive side and get more holes where there's not enough electrons, and we'd somehow like to shove them back in to the negative side so we go back to the way we were. Too many, lots of electrons on the negative side and not enough on the positive side. Well, look at this direction of this alternator. It'll actually push electrons. It'll actually pull them off of the positive side of the battery and push them back onto the negative side. There's a kind of an ammeter that you can put in a battery circuit, and it, in cars, this is usually the ammeter, and that ammeter has a plus side, and it has a negative side. And when the battery is getting charged, like in this condition, the needle points slightly to the positive side, and that's telling you the battery is getting charged. But this is really just a needle that's telling you which direction are the electrons going. If we turned off the alternator, if we opened the switch, turned off the alternator, or maybe before we started the engine, but we turn on the battery switch, the alternator is going to show negative. So negative over here is a discharge. And if the needle's on this side, it means the battery's getting charged. So that's the way most alternate ammeters are in cars unless you have a car like mine and it doesn't tell you anything. It just a light comes on that looks like a battery that's effectively saying your battery's not getting charged. I don't like it because it doesn't have a needle. I'd like to know what's going on. A 1969 Cessna 172, on the other hand, it doesn't even have a red idiot light. All it has is this, this ammeter. So the pilot has to look at this ammeter every few minutes to see if the battery is charging or not. The week I bought the airplane in 2007, I took off out of Fresno Air Terminal. And, of course, they got a tower and approach control, and I had all my radios on, and I had most of my lights on because it was near an airport, and you usually turn on your lights so other airplanes can see you easy. And I hadn't quite left Fresno's airspace, and I looked down at the ammeter, and the ammeter showed a negative number. And I'd never seen that in flight before. And it took me about 10 or 15 seconds of looking at it and looking away and looking at it going, Oh, wait. My battery is being discharged. Why is that? Oh, wait. It must mean the alternator is not working because that airplane is so old it doesn't have red idiot lights. So I called up the tower and said, hey, my alternator just died. I'm turning around and coming back in and land. And interestingly enough, before I landed, I must not have been looking at that often enough because I turned off as much of the radio equipment as I could. But the, air, the battery actually died before I landed, and they had to shoot a light at me, a green, steady light, to tell me that I was cleared to land because I couldn't hear them anymore. The radios went bad because the, the battery went dead before I landed. And we're going to get to procedures like that before this semester is over. Okay, so to do that very rapidly, once you turn on the engine and you get the alternator working, the alternator has a higher voltage than the battery. So it does two things. Not only does it provide electrical power to all the components in the, in the circuit, it also, since it has a higher voltage than the battery, the alternator will also charge the battery. And if you think about it, sucking the electrons out of the positive side and shoving them back onto the negative side of the battery, then all the arrows work. Okay, so let's take a peek at the 
let's look at another ammeter. Say blue. So here's our alternator, and we have a direction of electrons coming in and out of the alternator. And some of these electrons will go that direction. And while we're charging the battery, some will go in and charge the battery. And the electrons will get sucked out of the positive side of the battery. And so here's a path for electrons to go if this switch is closed. There's a second kind of an ammeter. This ammeter is also called a load meter. But it's really just measuring amps. But it goes from zero to some other number. We'll just say it's 100. Let's say this alternator is rated or has a capacity of 60 amps. That means if the alternator is not running, let's say you haven't turned on the switch yet. Yeah, Jaron, go ahead. Well, since you asked nice. I have, I have two left. Anybody want to wrestle for them? Thanks, that's a good idea. Next time I'll pass out a second, second one. So if this alternator is rated at 60 amps, then even if the alternator was spinning as fast as it could and we turned on lots and lots and lots of stuff, then this needle would never go above 60. So what do you think this would read if we hadn't started the engine yet? We turn on the battery switch. The alternator is not spinning. And the alternator switch is in the OFF position. How many amps is the alternator generating? Zero. So what is this load meter going to read? Zero. So even if we start the engine, until we close this switch and turn it into the ON position, it's still going to read zero. So as soon as we close that switch, which is right after or just before the engine is started, this needle is going to move up. It's probably going to move up to somewhere around 20 amps because the battery will have been depleted and the alternator will be producing a lot of electrons trying to charge the battery. If we turn on some other device, let's just say it takes 10 amps, and let's say this device takes 10 amps, then 20 amps, and let's say the battery is taking 20 amps, 20 plus 10 plus 10 is 40. So we turn this on and it goes to 20, but as soon as we turn on this device here, the needle goes up to 30, and as soon as we turn on this other device, the needle goes up to 40. So this load meter, it doesn't tell us exactly that the battery is getting charged. It's telling us how, many, how much power the alternator is producing. So let's say it goes to 40. If we sit there and watch it for about five minutes, the battery will get charged across that five minutes, and that needle where is it? That needle will come down about 18 amps. Because even when the battery is being completely charged, it's going to take 1 to 2 amps, even though the battery is completely charged. So we could turn this off, and we could turn this one off, and the only thing in the system is the battery. that zero, this needle is still going to be at one to two amps. And that's if everything's turned off and the battery is completely charged, this will never quite go to zero. But it, so I, know, I know that we have a lot of experienced private pilots in the room, so how often after you get the engine started do you have everything turned off? Almost never. The Hobbs meter, it doesn't even have a switch. It's going to run. There's a clock in the airplane. That doesn't have a switch. It's going to run. As soon as you turn the engine on, as soon as you start the engine, the first thing you're going to do is look at the oil pressure. And that needle starts to move. How fast does it need to move? 
within 30 seconds. If you move within 30 seconds, you immediately shut off. Okay, so the engine starts up. The oil pressure needle comes up. The next thing you're going to do is turn on a switch and turn on all the radios. Before you started the engine, you're going to turn on the anti-collision light. The anti-collision light is usually either a rotating beacon or a red strobe light on top of the airplane. And you turn that on just before you start the engine. So people walking around on the airport ramp will see a blinking red light and they will, even if they can't hear it. Plane of rotation of their propeller. Because they were thinking about doing that the previous minute. So that, that anti-collision light is going to be on. There's a bunch of stuff on the airplane. In fact, most people, they leave the collision light switch in the ON position, in the ON because you never have it on. After you shut the engine off, you could reach over and turn it off. Once the engine is off, you just reach over and turn the electrical master off. So in my airplane, the, the, the rotating beacon, the anti red anti-collision light, I never move that switch. It's always in the on position. So pretty much your, this load meter is never going to read just one or two amps. It's always going to read five or ten or something. Let's try a different color just because. All right. So let's look at this circuit breaker here. Let's just say that this light bulb is rated at 7 amps. That's how much electricity, norm, how many electrons normally go through it. So that's normal. This circuit breaker, if you read on it, it's probably going to say it's a 10 amp circuit breaker. And remember from yesterday, let's see, let's harass Jordan. Hey, Jordan. What's the purpose of a circuit breaker that you're going to know for the final exam at the end of the semester? To make sure what doesn't hold too many electrons? You're on the right track. It's actually preventing too many electrons from going through the wire. That's okay. How many years with electrical systems? None. Okay. So you're just trying to remember words from yesterday. So I'm, when I say I'm harassing you, I'm, I'm not really trying to harass you. Yeah, the, the circuit to keep the wires from getting too hot. What makes the wire hot? Electrons going through it. Whenever you push electrons through a wire, the wires go warm. If the wire is a big enough diameter, it won't get very warm. If the wire is smaller, it'll get warmer. So we don't want to have an electrical fire. We don't want to have the wires to get too hot. So the circuit breaker will pop. Literally, the circuit breaker is a switch, just like these other switches. So inside of this circuit breaker is a switch like this one, except that it will open up if too many electrons try to go through it. So if here's our alternator and electrons are going through it, we'll, we'll make an assumption our switch here is closed. Missed. There we go. This circuit breaker will pop at 10 amps. But you'll notice there's a difference here, 7 amps and 10 amps, 7 amps and 10 amps. This 10 amps is based on the wire. The size of the circuit breaker is based on how big is the wire and when does it have to pop to keep the wire from getting too hot. You'll notice at 9.9 .9 amps, will 9.9 .9 amps pop this circuit breaker in theory? No. But what about the light bulb? If it's designed for 7 amps, but you push 9.9 .9 amps through it, what's going to happen to the light bulb? Will it be brighter or dimmer than normal? It'll be brighter if you push more electrons through it. How long will that light bulb last it compared to putting 7 amps through it? It won't last as long. You see what I mean? The circuit breaker is not there to protect the component. It's not there to protect the device. Circuit breaker is there to protect the wires from getting so hot that they will cause an electrical fire. But generally, as a rule of thumb, if you were a pilot and you looked into an aircraft and you looked at the circuit breakers and you saw a 10 amp circuit breaker, generally you would go, aha, the component in that circuit probably under normal circumstances 
uses 7 amps. Actually, normal circumstances, I would say under normal maximum circumstances. Like, for instance, let's try this one here. Let's just say that this component is actually a radio transmitter. It's hard to draw sideways. And when I say a radio transmitter, it also receives. And let's say when it's receiving, it uses one amp. But when it's transmitting, it uses seven amps. Now, most of the time, if you're listening to the radio, you're not talking. You're not transmitting. Most of the time, there's only one amp going through this radio. But whenever you push the button to talk, it now uses seven amps because it uses as much power as it needs to transmit. So what is that circuit breaker probably rated at? Yeah, that's right. The circuit breaker is probably rated somewhere around 10 amps. But most of the time... How many amps are going through the wire? One, because most of the time you're just listening to the radio. You're not talking on it. So you see, you can't just say, okay, there's a 10-amp circuit breaker. It's using 7 amps most of the time. No, it's using 7 amps under its normal maximum amount. Okay, there's one other gauge I want to talk about, and it's the voltmeter. You need to understand that voltage is a measurement of pressure, just like water pressure in your house. You don't need to write it down, but most household water pressure is between 30 and 50 PSI, 30 and 50 pounds per square inch. If you look at the tire pressure on a car, most car tire pressure is anywhere from 25 to 35 PSI, pounds per square inch. It's a measurement of pressure. So water pressure in your house is just a little bit more, maybe 10, 20, 30 percent more than the pressure in most car tires. Okay, in an electrical system, voltage is the word for pressure. That's how much push is there. So let's just say for buy a, a, a D battery at the grocery store, you buy two of them, you're going to put them in a flashlight. If the battery hasn't been discharged yet and you hook a voltmeter up to it, does anybody know what is the pressure that that battery is trying to push? Most A, AA, B, Cs, Ds, those batteries have 1.5 volts. I don't know if you, I'm very familiar with D batteries. In any case, but if, I just, but if I don't hook that battery up to anything, am I draining it? If you don't hook anything up to it, it's not draining. So it has pressure. Okay, it's just like the water pressure in your house. If you turn off all the faucets in your house and you don't flush the toilets, the water pressure in your house will just say it's 40 PSI. No water's coming out, but there's still pressure. So you can have pressure even if water's not moving. In electricity, you can have pressure, you can have voltage, even if nothing is moving. So in this circuit here, if you turn the, ba the battery switch, the master switch to off, the battery still has 12.6 volts of pressure, even though nothing's moving. Amps is a measurement of how many electrons are moving per second. Let's say, you, let's try the water analogy. Let's say that uh, you put a bucket in the kitchen sink and you turn on the faucet and it fills up a gallon bucket in one minute. Say that the amount of water flowing is one gallon per minute. That's how much water is flowing within a certain amount of time. That's the same with amps. Amps is how many electrons are flowing per second. So gal if, if you ever had a car and you had their, and you were, well, like in airplanes, we're going to fly airplanes someday maybe. You're going to look at gallons per hour. If it burns 10 gallons per hour, how many gallons are moving through the system in a certain amount of time? Electrons or amps, how many electrons are moving through in a certain amount of time? That's amps. So you can, if, let's say you open, let's say you had instead of 40 PSI in your house, you had 80 PSI. Could you fill that bucket up faster? Yeah, you leave the faucet where it is, but if somebody on the outside of the house supplied 80 PSI to your house instead of 40 PSI, the water would come out of that faucet a whole lot faster. It's as fast. Same 
the voltage in electricity. If you doubled the voltage, you could push twice as many electrons through a circuit. But that doesn't work out very well because what about that light bulb? If we hooked it up to a 12-volt battery, what if we hooked it up to a 24-volt battery? It would burn really, really bright for a very, very short period of time, maybe less than a second. So what we need in aircraft electrical systems is reasonably constant voltage. The difference between 12 volts and 14 volts is, is okay. That's, on, that's only about 15 or 18 percent difference. That still can be components in the system need to be able to work when the battery is not getting charged. So in fact, you can write this down. When the battery gets down to 11 volts, nothing in the aircraft electrical system. Yeah, if you have a voltmeter hooked up to your system, and that needle is slowly going down, by the time it gets to 11, no electrical components on the aircraft will work anymore. And usually, the radios are the most sensitive to voltage, so they will stop working first. Your light bulbs get dimmer and dimmer. And unfortunately, when you're flying along, you re I personally, don't get me wrong, I like to have the lights on, the strobe lights, so other planes can see me, but I like to be able to talk to the radio if I'm in places, especially if I'm in their airspace and I'm supposed to be talking to them. And, and we won't get into it later, but there's some nice radios that you can don't even have to talk to, and you can send them messages. There's a transponder. It's got a four-digit code. If you type in 7700, it means you're having an emergency. If you type in 7600, 7600, that means you can't talk on the radio or you can't hear them. Have communications failure. 75 being hijacked. Yeah, yeah. Hijackers don't know that, but uh, if you crank in 7,500 down there, the, the air traffic control computers are set up. If somebody cranks in 7,500, 7,600, 7,700, the alarm goes off, and you get highlighted on that scope, and they tell their boss, Hey, boss, somebody's got 7,500. You think they just accidentally set it, or you think they're really getting hijacked in that Cessna 152? Yeah, I don't think that comes up very often, but 7,600 is lost communications, and 7,700 means, oh, no, I may be dying here soon. Of course, that doesn't do you any good unless you can talk to them on the radio, but 7,600 works out pretty nice because now they know, aha, they're having a communication failure. So they'll try to listen to you, but you might not hear anything. Jonathan. They're, all they know, they're just going to call law enforcement wherever they think you're going. So there'll be somebody there with guns when you land and badges, even though, you know, we don't need no stinking badges. But does anybody know what movie that's from? I'll give you a dollar if you don't look it up and you can tell me in the next 30 seconds. Whoever's the first time in a movie where somebody said, and I'm not going to use an accent this time, we don't need no stinking badges. I'll give you a hint. He has a Spanish, the gentleman that says this has a Spanish accent, and he's actually a bandito in northern Mexico. What's the state of Mexico immediately south of California? Is that Chihuahua? No, Tijuana is a city. Pardon me? Jalisco? What's the state? Immediately south of California. So nobody has Mexican geography down? If you should. Which one? Sonora or which one? Sinaloa? With a T? C. With an S. Spelled with an S? Okay. Maybe it's Sonora. In any case, the movie is set in northern Mexico. Okay, your 30 seconds is up. It's called Treasure of the Sierra Madre. Starring Humphrey Bogart, and he's got a ba bunch of bags of gold on his on his burro, and uh, the band. Isn't that how you say it? Okay, you're laughing at me. Yeah, he's got some bags of gold on his burro, and he's coming into town because he's been out in the mountains 
mining gold. He's kind of gone a little bit insane. But these guys come up, and they say that they're the Federales. And he says, well, if you're the Federales, where's your badges? So the head bandit says, oh, we're the Federales, but badges, we don't need no stinking badges. Of course, he has a Spanish accent when he says that. Okay, I'll try to bring in that movie clip on another day. All right, so I'm going to say that again here. If this is the voltmeter right here, and the vol if the battery, let's say the alternator is not on. We'll say the alternator is not on. And so that means if we just turned it on, it'd be at 12.6 volts. But this needle is slowly going to go down towards 11.0 volts. And by the time it gets to 11, the battery's dead. Nothing on the airplane is going to work. But the, 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 the radios may go bad at 11.8 or 11.6 volts. They're going to go first. Now, if we started up the engine and we got the alternator spinning, that's going to pump the voltage up, and this voltmeter's going to go somewhere between 13.5 to 14 volts. So you might be on an airplane that has a voltmeter. So it's kind of nice to know what does it mean if it's at 13 and a half or 14. You go, yay, the alternator's working. It's probably charging the battery. Or you look at the voltmeter and it says 12.6. You're going, hmm, maybe the alternator just died and now I've only got 20 or 30 minutes till the battery goes dead. Or the voltage is already down at 12 and you're going, the radios are going to quit pretty soon. Okay, we're going to call it quits for air for power plants and systems. <laughs>